So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of different things. Um, really, I'm going to focus on some time-aware phenotype modeling that we've been doing in 4CE. And there's another project that we've had now for about a year called Recover. So the um, government became very concerned about post sequelae of COVID because our citizens were very uh, vocal, fortunately, about the fact that this new disease that we have, that um, you know everybody kind of, I think our, our president at the time called it a cold, um, is uh, one, I mean, it had like a, a they were measuring a 12% mortality, right, when it finally came over here, and that was really alarming. And then after you get COVID, about 20% of our folks were getting all kinds of strange after effects. And it wasn't clear what was going on. And those after effects were trouble breathing. It was they were getting arrhythmias and heart problems. And then one of the most distressing was they were getting this extreme fatigue or brain fog. And that would cause uh, people who, you know, I mean, <laughs> you've got executives and, I mean, high functioning folks of all different natures who couldn't function anymore. And the amount of impact that would have to our economy is unbelievable, right? So they put together this, this study now called Recover, and they are using I2B2 as the core for that to study post-COVID disorders. And they're doing it through REDCap, um, where uh, they are interviewing uh, about 40,000 people, and then we're gathering lots of other data from them as well, and applying various kinds of techniques to understand what is going on with this post-COVID disorder. So what I'm going to show you today, though, is a very I2B2-centric view of post-COVID disorder, and how we can are particularly, how we are particularly uh, suitable for studying post-COVID disorder in, um, in this age. So it starts with um, I2B2 really being a long history of what happened to each patient over time, right? That's essentially what the master table, which often has billions and billions of facts and events that occurred to our patients, what is it that is the sequence of those things that are occurring? And so just to kind of you know, make a, a little cartoon, you can see up here that you've got a number of um, uh, tracks on EHR records, labs, uh, diagnoses being made of all different kinds, um, medications being given. And then in the middle of all that, they get COVID. And then something happens and they start to get what we call this post-acute COVID phenotype. And so the time is marching on. And I2B2 and its fact table is really all of these dots. And that is kind of the key, then, to understanding, right, what is going on after COVID. And so you can use this approach where you make these aggregated vectors, right, which are basically a time series. And it turns out that when you make these aggregated vectors of a time series in different kinds of sequential patterns, they actually can be very specific where a single event, right, is not, but when you have a series of events, it becomes very specific. And let me just kind of show you some very general kinds of ways to look at this, where you have, you can compute using these matrices, right, of different kinds of events, and basically they'll show you something like this, and I gotta put my glasses back on to tell you the specifics here. So let's say you're interested in heart failure, right? And it turns out that um, heart failure is um, uh, only accurate in the electronic medical record. And I'm going to use this 
uh, reference to the electronic medical record over and over to talk about how single diagnoses and other facts in the electronic medical record and in almost all different kinds of real world data are just wrong many, many times. And in fact, in, in heart failure, it is um, wrong about uh, 45, uh, 55% of the time. So if you get everybody who had a code for heart failure, you'll find that the orange, which are the negative cases, are there about 55% of the time. But if you combine it with two events, so for example, heart failure and then getting benzodiazepines, interestingly, or heart failure and then getting chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you'll find that it's accurate much, much, that series of events is much more accurate, right? So if you look for the series of events, it's much more accurate to diagnose heart failure from real world data than if you just look at a single event alone. And that repeats itself over and over. And in a way, what you're doing, right, is you're kind of saying, you're making a prediction of what's going to happen to somebody who has heart failure in the inverse way, right? So this same kind of framework can use, be used to uh, get more specificity in what's happening from the real world data, or be used to predict if you ha what's going to happen uh, if you have a code for heart failure, for example. So coming back to what the, we're doing in I2B2, we do both hypothesis generation from real world data. And I remember that we had that question, right, which was, what is it that uh, we do in I2B2? What's the definition of I2B2? And just to be, I would say it's the software, right? It's the I2B2 software that's really the magic from I2B2. And all those uh, different plugins and add-ons that this community has made to the software over the years, the data model, right, and it, we don't even, we, we, the data model is defined by the ontology, really. And the schema of I2B2, we have a star schema, is simply there for the software to work on. And the schema, right, allows you to do these time series with hypothesis generation. And then we also have, so if you go into, if you go into what we really get at the end of the day out of I2B2, it's this four column table, which I think both Kavi and uh, Griffin has shown, right? Which is this time series of events where you simply have a patient, a time, a concept, and a value, right? And so all the work that's done in these prediction models are being done off of that time series of events. Now, sometimes we pivot it and we make something called the big fat table, right? This is the Y table that many of our R programs and analysis routines work off of. And so we don't want, so when we're, when we're actually, you know, we know what we're doing, <laughs> we can use the, the Y table to record our features. But when we are looking for something, we use the four column table. So all of the work that I'm going to show you actually dr drives itself, the software, off the four column table. So you take I2B2, you make it into a four column table. You take OMOP and you make it into a four column table and you can drive the software that I'm going to talk about. The software is called Mellow. It's available on a GitHub, so you can just go and look it up on the, on the internet. Um, it use, it's used to study these evolving phenotypes, and it was really uh, a key th piece of software that we used in uh, 4CE and using in Recover. And we used it in a number of cases. I'm going to just show you a number of use cases. The first one, all related to COVID, of course, one was just under predicting COVID-19 mortality using real-world data, EMR. And so what we show here is just early on in the pandemic, what was it that could predict that somebody has, uh, was going to have a severe case of COVID? And you can see, by the way, that one of those things was diabetes. And I'm going to keep coming back to diabetes type 2. But this is in a very general sense. And then the second thing was, what's their, what's their hospital course going to be, right? 
So based upon the record, we could predict with some accuracy what their hospital course was going to be. And then finally, once they got COVID, what was it that was going to happen to their symptoms afterwards? And so there was a large array of different kinds of symptoms that were actually discovered in some cases for the first time by this, uh, by this study. One of them was, um, interestingly, alopecia, which later became, or hair loss. Interestingly, it was only observed immediately following COVID. Long term, it's not been shown, and, and that's been reaffirmed, actually, um, in, in, in several other studies. This loss of taste and smell, that's well known at this point. I think it was actually pretty well known then. Um, but one thing that wasn't well known uh, was type 2 diabetes. You see, after chronic fatigue, which we knew was happening, type 2 diabetes. So what is going on in this case? We had shown that type 2 diabetes could lead to COVID. But type 2 diabetes being an effect of COVID right? That's a totally different animal. And in fact, it was somewhat unbelievable. And there was a lot of talk about, well, maybe it's all just confounded, right? What you really have are folks who had type 2 diabetes all along, and somehow it's just being recorded after. Um, and so you needed this, actually, this prediction model, right? So you needed this prediction model, because what this prediction model essentially does is it says, okay, if you have A, and you're going to get, you're going to get B, and then you get a certain, and then you measure it, and you compare what you measure to what you have predicted. And then that tells you if your model supports or does not support that prediction, right? So first you predict, and then you compare to the real world data. And repeatedly, right, we were coming up with the fact that type 2 diabetes was actually a result of. Uh, of having had COVID. Um, and so you can make these matrices, and, and, and this was also part of this, which kind of looked at all these different predictions and how they were evolving. And if you look at type 2 diabetes, you'll see it was a little bit like alopecia, right? In that you see how um, alopecia, right, it's right up there at the top. And then it goes and it disappears completely uh, six to nine months later. And diabetes was actually not disappearing, right? But it was becoming less important, it seems, in the long list of other things which were calculated. However, I should say, in the meantime, many other publications were made that uh, uh, supported the fact that type 2 diabetes seemed to be evolving from uh, COVID-19, and it's still not really that clear why that would be, frankly. There's immunological explanations, there's metabolic explanations, and so forth, but not, not, not totally clear. Interestingly, so what we found is, so we developed something called a loyalty cohort. And the loyalty cohort, I'm going to talk a lot about when I talk about um, the digital twin, because it really is a way to measure how complete the data is that you're working on and kind of selecting patients who have complete data, right? Because if you don't have complete data, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you're missing. And so what we, when we measure the effect, what we can actually see and to, the, to, 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 to the left here is uh, patients who are more loyal and to the right are less loyal. <laughs> and what we mean, we, we like to use the word loyal because it kind of it gives you the whole idea that these are patients who keep coming back to the same hospital system over and over, right? One of the big problems of real world data is if you go to lots of different hospital systems and you're just making your measurement in one hospital system, you're going to have a lot of missing data, right? But if, you, if, if it's a patient who's coming back to your system, the same system, then you're not going to have as much missing data. The other part of loyal is they are being loyal to their medical care, right? And you'll see we do measure that by how often they return for their regular visits. And so what we get here is when we measure, when we have lots of, when we don't have a lot of missing data, we get a much stronger effect, you can see, for type 2 diabetes than we have a lot of missing data. And we find this over and over, and that when we have missing data, it tends to drive our results uh, 
to have a lot of type 2 error, right? It has a lot of, um, we, we tend to have a lot of negative effects, right? Or things that, uh, things cannot be found. So it's very important to have um, uh, complete data in order to do these kinds of calculations. But in this case, you kind of can see that the better the data, the more complete the data, the more strong, the stronger the effect actually is, right? And people, the, the, the reason this is important is because the counter argument was, well, they weren't having much data collected on them before, and now they're having more data collected on them now, and that's why we're just now recording type 2 diabetes that they always had after they had COVID. But this is saying, no, that's not true, right? The people who had data collected on themselves all the whole time are actually the ones where you see a stronger effect. Now, the other thing you can do with this prediction model is you can say, okay, so I've got a prediction and I'll see how well it evolves in the future. And I just wanted to throw this in that we actually do see systematic bias of certain groups, both racial and ethnic, in that we have trouble making predictions on them when they're, um, uh, and you can see here that what this, these lines are showing as they go to the right is how well our predictions are working, right? And sometimes they really break down. And they really break down, it seems, when our patients are Hispanic, right? You see that purple one? See, it really starts to break down, implying that we don't have a good model for them, right? Somehow our results were never, they were not, we were not getting a good sample to develop our predictions. So we can look at different ways, right? Not only that we make predictions, but also how bad our predictions can be at times and try to fix them, right, for, for future reference. But uh, so it's important, I think, um, to, you know, take kind of a somber approach to that as well and understand, you know, where we may be failing so that we can, we can fix things. So thank you very much. And um, maybe Griffin can come up too and we'll answer some questions. Yes. It requires, so that analysis required a um, test, a positive test of COVID. Now we've done other analyses that you didn't need a positive test, you just needed an annotation that you had had COVID, because a lot of times patients come in from somewhere else and they've had COVID, but they didn't have their test at the hospital. But in that case, this case in particular, I think we had to have a positive test for COVID. that they had COVID? That is great. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of doing an inverse prediction kind of thing. Yeah, very, very, very interesting question. Um, I don't know, but we could try it. Yeah. Probably at this point, almost everybody has had it. Yeah. So if your model is just, yes, you're going to be good. And so a, a finger count, I think, is when they first got it. What's the index of that? And that's getting into some tricky and tricky questions. The time series, right, right, that's, a, that's an excellent point. So we sometimes have intervals built into the time series, so the one point has to be 30 days later or more, but no, but otherwise, no, it's not atomic enough to do what Griffin was saying. Yes, very good, good point. Yes. So, so that's a great question. So the question is, is our, is our failure, right, to do accurate predictions for Hispanics related to um, accessibility or, or trouble collecting data on that population? And the answer is, um, I don't really know, uh, because um, the, me the, the measure is too coarse to, um, to kind of get into the, into the why. But um, it certainly seems like those would be good candidates for why it is that we aren't getting as good of uh, 
predictions. Yes. So do we use any chart review or unstructured data? So we don't use, for that, those studies, we did not use any unstructured data. Um, what we do, we do do chart review to get all your PPDs and all the statistics out of there. But we didn't do chart review to actually create the data, right? Unlike Recover, by the way, where we do do chart review to create some of the data. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So the question, uh, uh, so, um, so Jeff, where is Jeff? Is Jeff playing here? Anyway. So Jeff has actually done, gone, so uh, even a more basic question. So let's say, you know, you have a severe anything, right? In, and you're in the ICU. Is that lead to things like fatigue, right? I mean, I don't care what it is, flu, automobile accident, I mean, anything, right, uh, as a control, essentially, for, you know, something that happens after, you know, whatever that event is. And so what we have done is kind of looked at it from that point of view, and that, you know, from a kind of sociological point of view, you know, if somebody has a, has a tough hospital course, and then you have something, you know, that is, is happening to them afterwards, you know, can you distinguish that? if somebody had COVID versus one of those other things. Um, flu, I, I know that OMOP used flu in order to, to, to try to tease that out. I'm not sure how successful that was just because the patterns of the diseases changed and the patterns of data collection changed. And one thing Griffin's really emphasized a lot is that um, when we, we, it's hard to per, compare pre-COVID data to COVID data, right, because the data, the, the patterns of data collection and the data completeness actually changed quite a bit. So, and a lot of the flu stuff that OMOP based on it, for example, was pre, was, was pre-COVID, right, pre-2020. And so then, and obviously the COVID stuff was 2020 and on. So that's, it's difficult to compare those two for that reason. So we, we the reason, so we took the, the severity approach where it was simultaneous right, because it was patients who were in the hospital at the same time, but for a different thing than COVID, right, who are having a severe course. And you do see a lot of overlap of what you think might have happened because of COVID, but actually it's just because somebody had a hard time. Yes, sir. Great question. So the question is, aren't people who would, are sicker tend to be more loyal? And the answer is not really. So at the high end of the curve, you can see a correlation. It's not a great correlation. But at the lower end of the curve, you see very lo lo loyal people who are not sick. And, and, but, you, but, but still, they're, they're and, and so, and the way we know that, or the way we do it is we, we, we compare it to the Charleston index of the patients. And you see a little bit of correlation, but not much. I looked into that question on, uh, by linking patients, to looking at claims data, where we do have complete data and seeing where they go. And the, the actual, when patients are really, really sick, um, they're very rarely loyal. There was some reason they had to go to some other site for something. It could be simple as they go to receive their eye exam somewhere else, or psychiatric care, or they had a car accident outside of their uh, main town. So we change a little bit, and instead of, loyal, we have almost loyal. We can define that as like 90% of your visits or 95% of your diagnoses. And when you do that definition, then these algorithms for selecting almost loyal patients, the, um, the more data that they have, it's more likely that they are almost loyal to your institution. So it's kind of just some little semantics on that that um, uh, will affect the, um, the definitions in which patients you pull out a, a little bit. The, on the opposite end, if you had a patient at your institution with like one visit, it's almost certain that um, they're at, um, they come, they're, 
you're not their loyal institution. It's another place where they receive a lot of their care. And they're probably really sick because they need to go to other places to get some. So the patient with one fact is probably a sick patient, but not at your institution, at another location. Definitely. So um, at the last AMIA, we kind of presented this as a framework going forward, like period, right, for all kinds of AI studies in which you should, I mean, most AI studies can do this kind of analysis because most of them are making predictions of some sort. So they can, like, move it forward. It's, it's not that, you know, it's just you just have to do it, you know. And then you can see, uh, because once you are, become aware of just how poor some of the models are for some of these uh, uh, ethnic groups and so forth, you then, it's very sobering and, you're, and, and, and it becomes you know, a real battle cry to like fix that, right? If you're not aware, then you know, you don't, you know. So it's, yeah, I mean it's, it's um, you could actually use this or, or other things as a model for you know, at least becoming aware. And, and it actually does make suggestions in terms of like, you know, more data would be better here, or so forth. Thank you. Um, I'm part of a, an, a separate NIH consortium called Aim Ahead. Um, and it's interesting project. It's about um, addressing diversity in AI ML models. And the sort of hypothesis that NIH has on this is that there's two issues. One is making sure that the, the patient populations that you are training AI models on are diverse, so you're capturing the different racial and ethnic groups but also that the um, scientists who are generating those AI models also come from diverse backgrounds. Because there's biases when you're developing a model on which variables you're going to be pulling in, what you're including in those things. And if you have some implicit bias on what you think is going to be correlated with the condition, you're going to be incorporating that into the model based on which features you're selecting. So we have a, a fellowship program that's launching right now that's leveraging ITP2 data sets from um, uh, claims data, actually, but uh, the fellowship program is to bring in um, uh, young investigators from different backgrounds that will help um, address both the diversity in the patient population, but also in the scientists leveraging these tools. It could be, and it's not in the model. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Um, well, so genetics is always something that could be part of a prediction model. Um, and, you know, we, so in, in eMERGE, we look for that um, using PRS scores, so polygenic risk scores, where you put together all the variants in the whole genome which might, you know, predict the disease and so forth and try to do that. Um, the effects usually are pretty small, I have to say, at this point. Um, and um, maybe it's just because we don't know the right variants to actually, you know, calculate with. Or maybe it's just that the environment has more influence than genetics often, but. What's that? No. Totally different project. Oops. Totally different project. 
No, all we do in Emerge, so in Emerge, there is a, uh, the Emerge 4 is all about using um, PRS scores to um, let patients know if they're at a high risk for a disease or not. And there's uh, 10 different diseases that we let people know if they're at a high risk for. And um, but the high, the high risk that we're letting them know about isn't really very high. There's other influences such as, you know, cholesterol levels and so forth tend to be much more influential. Yes. Yes, even, even in these analyses, we, we use about 12 different, um, yeah, we plug in 12 different models. 